Hey, I'm Perry Greenwood. I'm Senior Product Manager here at Backbox. Hello, I'm Josh Stevens, CTO at Backbox. All right, and we're going to talk about programmability, APIs, and integrations. So when it comes to programmability, we think about it in two terms, right? Um, there is the programmability where you can extend scripts. And we talked about this a little bit during the OS upgrades conversation. Um, and then there's the programmability where you want to integrate with outside services or sources or you know whatever system that you're you have in your uh, IT department that you've you know homegrown. Um, so those are the two conversations that we're going to have in this um, section. So I want to show an example of what it is our scripts look like. So this is going to be our IntelliTrex uh, scripts. Um, they're a little bit more, they're so they're device aware, uh, and they have both a automation portion, which is a check, and then they have the ability to have a remediation portion. So if we go to something that is, there we go, that we have some variables on. So this would be something like ensuring a HA reserved management interface is configured. Um, you can see that where you, we go and we define a few variables within this. This is how you work with scripts within Backbox. You define the variables for what you're working on. So let's say you're working on NTP servers, right? The NTP server from one region to another uh, that you're dealing with may be different. And so you may want to point your devices to the appropriate server. Uh, and you don't want to hard code that into your task automation. This is how you define those. You say ahead of time, hey, I'm going to have a variable, and this will come through in my job where I can fill out these dynamic fields um, later on. You define commands. So with the IntelliJex uh, and, and tasks, it's the same thing, right? It's a little bit of Linux and a whole lot of the CLI or APIs that you're used to working with with the device. So you can you know, run curl commands, uh, you can run Python from our scripts. Um, so all of that is available within the Backbox platform. Uh, but the way to extend these is really just understanding the device that you're working with, having the baseline knowledge, and adding that into this flow as commands. Um, with the IntelliChecks, you're able to uh, script the simple um, check first, and if it fails that, you also get the chance to do a scripting of remediation. So, hey, if I'm working on, let's say, NTP servers again, if my NTP server is not right for what I expect it to be, just go ahead and fix it. So that's the, uh, the, the viewpoint on how you would extend Backbox through scripting. Um, you can take one of these uh, pre-built automations, you can clone it, use that as a starting point. Um, all of these are you know, available. There's over 2,300 automations built into Backbox. So it's not like an Ansible where you start with zero. Um, we start with you know, a, a big library that we've built that we support. Um, and then you can grab that. You can build on top of it. We can leverage our professional services to help you build things as well. Could you jump back to the commands tab just for a second? So if sure. You um, so, like in this case, we're looking for we're doing a show file on a grep set interface. Yeah. Where where do you define in that what result you're looking for? Am I looking to see nothing? Am I looking to see something? So, is, all right. So we're matching it against a variable at the end. Exactly. What happens if you have? Can you do any multi-line stuff? So, for example. Um, one of the things I've had problems with in the past is I wanted to have radius servers defined. However, the order of radius servers or the order of DNS servers matters, mm, right? right? And not not every OS supports a you know primary, secondary, or and that kind of thing. Yes, uh, and NTP was the same actually sometimes. Yep. Um, so, how deep can you get into that? So let let's say for the device that you're working with, you can pull all of those with one show command. You know, imagine the best case, right? Um, you could dump that into, we have the ability to send that to a file. Um, so when we do this show full, it saves this variable into a 
um, into a variable, right? But you can send it to a file, and then you can use the uh, cat commands, et cetera, to parse that file. Um, right. And actually, that pop-up answers my second question, which was how did that get into that variable? And it's the save icon. Yeah. Pushes it to the variable. I, I just assumed it was to a file because it's a little disk you know, icon or something. I don't know, computer icon. That's cool. That explains a lot. Awesome. And, and I want to ask about how you can integrate this with the backups, because one of the things we've we've gone to doing for this kind of configuration mm -hmm. validation is uh, our current backup system saves the backups in a Git repository. So you can do a search there and you can find everybody that has the missing NTP server and you can export that as an input to the script that goes out and fixes them. Can we do that kind of thing here? Yes. Yeah, so the the way I would, yes, uh, I would personally do that via API. Uh, so exporting all these backups to your Git server, right? Doing the search and then uh, adding. You can't search the backups in here. You can search the backups and find the ones. That oh, are sorry. Missing. You're you're saying search within the config file on the back. Yeah. Instead of go running out to every device and doing a show command, I have the backup file. I know what that yeah. NTP. Can so be. that's no, the way most people. You, use. <laughs> you 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 aren't able to search backups. So you can go device by device, but you're looking for a search across. Yes, yeah, search, uh, search the backup so to see how it doesn't meet my configuration standards. The the way that yeah, so the way that we do this is the backups when they're stored on Backbox are encrypted entirely at risk, rest, right? So to do a search would require some sort of decryption um, on the set that you're looking for. If you're looking well, you at yeah, decrypt it for me. <laughs> 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 if if you want to export those backups, at that point we uh, you you can of course save them without encryption at all on Backbox. If you want to turn off keys, whatever, that's possible. No, uh, however, that wouldn't be my choice. You could also yeah. use the API, <laughs> or... right? The, the, you you can uh, there's a export task for backups. You can export them all if you want to do to your Git server, um, and you know data best practices obviously apply there. Where you know whatever it is you need to do to ensure they're encrypted and protected, um, do that. But no, within Backbox, we don't because of that encryption of our um, our backups. We don't allow the the searching today. That is a feature that we are looking into, but right now it's not there. Yeah, because it'd be a lot faster. It, well, we found it's a lot faster to search backups than to log into hundred devices. You know? Yeah, it, it is uh, the. Uh, the IntelliChecks with the remediation is pretty quick, but I, mean, I, I, I can see what you're saying where, hey, I want to search this in a backup first. Uh, the way we do that is through the IntelliChecks. Anyway. But we also can do it as part of the backup job. So as the backup is yeah. being pulled, go ahead and analyze it for the missing configurations and then okay. remediate it at that time. As opposed to doing it in bulk, we can do it in stream. With well, I, I've... I mean, change control process. I can't yeah. just immediately remediate it. I've got to get all the blessings and sign offs and right. yeah, that's change no windows. And <laughs> so I want to jump into um, APIs. Um, so you all are probably familiar, familiar with uh, VS Code here. Um, so this is, uh, this is live. Um, we're going to go ahead and do just a device add via API. Um, so one of the things about the API is uh, we dog food our own API, first of all, uh, and it's all documented here in the API tab. Uh, you get both the external API, which is things that these are always going to be static, and then you get the internal API, which sometimes these things will change, right? So there's uh, communication there about what to expect with external versus internal APIs uh, and our swagger. So you can see we have a, a large number of func functionalities there. So let's go ahead and jump into um, importing the, the um, devices to Backbox, right? Um, so some of the stuff is just libraries. Um, but then we get to how do we import it? Where do we import it from? Right now, this is a CSV that we're importing these devices from, right? Um, the thing about a CSV is it's really just a stand-in for whatever... Um, third-party system you want to use your CMDB uh, ServiceNow, um, I, I monitoring tool, monitoring tool, right? And what I think about when I'm thinking about why am I importing devices via API is something like 
hey, you guys have discovery, but I really don't want you to SSH scan or SNMP scan inside my firewall. I know what's there. I have a, a tool that's approved to go and check that, check for that stuff. Let me just send the data to you and uh, you can manage it once you have all the, the credentials, the data about the devices. So with that said, uh, you can see that we've pulled in a couple devices. Uh, we have some fields, external IDs, uh, IP addresses. This external ID is a really cool one. Uh, think about times where you have a device in your CMDB and then you have it in another system. You change the IP address and you're trying to sync on IP addresses across these systems. One system get it, gets it, the other doesn't, and now you're reporting on the wrong thing. So external IDs are something that we recommend in order to sync across um, all your systems and Backbox has a specific field just for that external ID to go into. All right, basically, you know, request a session, do some auth, and then send the uh, devices to Backbox. I didn't clear, clean them up properly before, so we got a, an error where it went and cleaned them up. But um, after that, you can see they're added to Backbox according to this. So we go and we make sure we should have uh, I am and Groot uh, in this. And we're, of course, we're going to clean up our session. So let's go to our back box server. And that is not what you want. Um, you want this. All right. So let's look at our devices. And you can see we've added those two devices at the bottom uh, via API. So API isn't just adding devices. You can kick off workflows. Um, you can check the status of jobs that are running on it. Um, you know, any of the logs you can pull via the API. Anything you can do in the GUI, you can do via our API. Yeah. Roughly, I don't know, a third, maybe 40% of our users pretty much just use the API. Um, everybody else is in the GUI. Uh, but like, like Perry said, if you can do it via the GUI, you can do it via the API. So oftentimes that's how people are integrating uh, with upstream systems. That's how they're integrating with network management systems and monitoring tools is using the API. Yep. In some networks that we're doing mergers and acquisitions on, um, we've started to use IPv6 as a common management addressing scheme because it doesn't have any you know, overlap with private addressing. Yep. So in larger networks, we've started to use that as a strategy to, to deduplicate. Where, how is the IPv6 support in Backbox if I'm having to reach a device that's managed on IPv6 only? Entirely native. <laughs> Entirely native? Oh, that's awesome. That's great to hear. Yeah. So even if I'm running not even just a dual stack, but just an IPv6 only network, yeah. you know, I can function and execute all these automations directly yes. over IPv6 only? Yeah, that's right. and, and yes, and we've, we've validated that. Yeah. That's, um, that, that's awesome. I don't, we don't usually hear that, yes, we have it, and yes, it works on IPv6 only, so that's an awesome answer to hear. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for the question, Kevin. That's yeah, spring, great. Springboarding off of that, uh, Jody Lemoyne, Ghost in the Net, at Ghost in the Net, um, you're fully DNS, or is it always IP addresses? So it's always IP addresses today. Uh, for our devices. Okay, so, but DNS is uh, something down the road? Um, I think DNS is something we could definitely look into, but it's not been a request of our customers today. Because the, the, biggest, the biggest complaint about IPv6 is, I don't want to type in the huge IP address. Ah, <laughs> okay. First, we shouldn't have been using IP addresses all along. That's what DNS is for. So that's... Really? <laughs> yeah, you, you think. Uh, and so DNS supports a logical. Mm. So, so I, the way I would do that is I would pull the devices off the DNS as those IP addresses from it, shove it into like a CSV and use exactly that device import that we just showed. As long as they don't change, you're all good. Uh, well, and again, that's the external ID piece, right? You have to have that consistent external IP. Great or question. Good question. External ID. ID. I hadn't even thought about <laughs> external ID. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That, that brings up a related question for me from what uh, Jody had asked, which is it, a lot of times when we're using tools like this, we won't run it in the main data plane of the network so that if we do have an oopsie and we knock down a routing protocol or something, you know, we'll do it in an out-of-band management, management network or, or okay. VRF. So I'm curious, is that where, where do you normally see this being run in a lot of networks? Is it normally run out-of-band or is it normally run in-band or is it both? Both. Both. If, if they have, a, have an out-of-band network, they're likely to run it there. 
But we don't see that very often, especially with MSP networks and even many enterprise organizations just haven't built out that out-of-band sort of telemetry-based network yet. Um, but I, I was really happy to hear your question, Kevin, because the, the question, the problem you guys have seen with the mergers and acquisitions, we see the same thing with MSPs where they're trying to manage lots of remote customers with the same private IP addresses in use behind natted firewalls, oftentimes the same device names being in use amongst those different customers. And something we talk to them about often is deploying a telemetry network, whether it's IPv6 or some other you know, private network space, some sort of overlay network so they can have reachability to all those remote devices. Um, and that's something we've been talking to them about a lot recently. Yep. Along those same lines, um, how are they solving that problem? Like, do you have a gateway that you can run inside of those managed networks so that you can deal with address overlap? Yes, yeah. that's how we do it today. Um, and that works great. Um, where we get some pushback is in really small remote networks with no compute devices available or very limited compute uh, bandwidth available. And so we're working on some other scenarios there. Um, this problem gets um, ex ex extended uh, when it's a very, very large MSP with, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 devices, you know, rolled around the world. So um, that's something we're working with our customers on. But today, the way it works is you, you deploy a remote agent to those devices, those, those remote networks. And not only does it work for doing the automation, but also all the discovery and such is done from those remote agents. Uh, 